If you're at Jeremiah 29, can I get you to make some noise because you're excited about the word of the Lord this morning? All right, let's try that one more time. If you're at Jeremiah 29, can I get you to make some noise because you're excited about the word of the Lord? Verse 11 says, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. In those days when you pray, I will listen. If you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. I will be found by you, says the Lord. I will end your captivity and restore your fortunes. I will gather you out of the nations where I sent you and will bring you home again to your own land. The scripture is clear that God has a proven plan for our lives. Somebody shout out a proven plan. As we've entered this series, we declared and we understand that God does not do things haphazardly, but is functioning according to a superior, a superb and superior plan for our lives. He has a proven plan for us. And the thing that we can delight in is that for every aspect of our lives, that God has a proven plan and that plan will bring us to a quality of life and a reflection of his love and so we established through our time of study God's proven plan for my salvation God's proven plan for our service God's proven plan for our success and God's proven plan for our situations apostle did a phenomenal job on last Sunday as he taught us on God's proven plan for family breakthroughs were you blessed by that word but once breakthrough happens, there's another step that hap that we need to take. And the next step after the family breakthrough is the reconciliation and restoration of the relationship. So once breakthrough occurs, I have to be committed to restoration and reconciliation of relationships. And my assignment today is really, it's dynamic because I want us to take a look at the Christmas story from the standpoint of it being a story and a message to us on restoration. That when you look at the Christmas story, encapsulated in the story is the message of restoration somebody shout out restoration and as I prayed about today's lesson and I really looked at the Christmas story I could see that it is a great story matter of fact let me say the greatest story of restoration that we've ever seen Christmas or the birth of Jesus is the proven plan of God to bring restoration to failed relationships it is more than just a story of a baby born in a manger but it is God's proven plan to bring restoration to failed relationships and I believe the truth that we will uncover today as we look a little closer at the Christmas story it will be something that will change your perspective on restoration but it will also serve as a model of restoration I submit to you that the Christmas story begins in the book of Genesis when God declares that the seed of a woman would bruise the serpent's head which was a declaration that a special being would be born who could restore mankind back to the original plan that God had for his creation. So from Genesis all the way through the Bible, we can see this plan of God for restoration between himself and man. And the commencement of that starts all the way back in Genesis. And what we can learn from this approach is a greater appreciation of the mission of the Christ child that was born. And we also have a model of what we should do to initiate restoration in broken relationships. And so today, Hey, we're about to look at the Christmas story through the lens of God's promise of restoration and its far-reaching message. See, restoration is a consistent theme in both the Old and New Testament. From Genesis all the way to Revelation, we see this act 
of bringing back to a former position or condition. Go over to Luke chapter 1 verse 30 because here we see the angel talking to Mary. Verse 30 says, And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God, and behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. The Bible is clear where it establishes the character of restoration. God is a God of restoration. I really need you to get that this morning because when you go in the scripture, you see the character trait of God that stands out amongst the rest is that he is a restorer and he majors in restoration. God majors, when you look in the Bible, you see that God majors in taking things that have been destroyed and ruined and by his power and grace, he restores them back and often making um, them better in the process. That's the kind of God that we serve, that he doesn't look at broken things and say, oh, well, but he, the power of God and the grace of God takes the broken and even makes them better than they were before. So he does it with the cities, he does it with broken lives, he does it with broken relationships, and he does it with broken dreams. Is there anybody in here, are there any areas in your life that you have experienced or that are broken and you need God's promise of restoration to move in those areas? Then I'm in the right place because what we see in the Bible is a promise of restoration. I can go all throughout the scriptures and there's this amazing promise of restoration. And what those scriptures establish for us is an expectation that God is willing to bring restoration in our lives for whatever has been lost or stolen. And if you've ever lost or stole or somebody or, or you feel like the enemy has stolen anything from you, you ought to rejoice about the promise promise of restoration. The Bible says in Joel 2 25, and I will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army, which I sent among you and ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord, your God that has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. God is a God of restoration. You go over to the New Testament and in 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 9 it says, Resist him, firming your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. That's good to know that God himself will restore restore, he will confirm, he will strengthen, and he will establish you. Not only do I have passages that declare that God is a God of restoration, but I can look at the profile of restoration, and I can see the fingerprint of God over all these stories in the Bible where God has restored man, and man experienced the power of restoration. See, to restore means that you take something that's out of order, and you bring it into order. So so there's the story of Job's restoration and after nine months of being afflicted by the devil and losing his family, he lost his fortune, he lost his health, God restored him to all, he restored all that he had lost and more. He didn't just bring him back to the place that he was, the Bible says that Job ended up with double than what he had before and what is that to us is that whatever you have lost or stolen, if God could do it for Job, you got a justifiable right to release your faith that you will come out restored and with double. There's a story of Hezekiah's restoration. The Bible talks about that he is facing this uh, tre treacherous enemies. Uh, the country is at the country's doorstep. And not only is he fighting an enemy, but his health has been uh, stricken. He's got this terminal illness and the prophet arrives with bad news. Everybody wants a prophetic word of what, what's good, what the good thing that's going to happen. But the prophet shows up and tells Hezekiah, set your house in order because you're about to die. So he has, he's being besieged by an enemy. 
And then now he has a bad report that his life is about to end. What does Hezekiah do in that situation? He goes to God on behalf of his faithfulness and he asks God to restore his health and protect him from his enemy. And what we see here again is that God puts his finger of restoration on Hezekiah's life. He heals him. He adds years to his life and he destroys the enemy. What does that tell you? And I, and, me, and I, we can go to God on the basis of our faithfulness and move the favor of God into our lives. And every now and then, you need to have a Hezekiah moment where you go to God and say, this is not my portion. I've been too faithful. I've been consistent. I got a seed in the ground. And God makes a promise that he will restore. There's a story of David's restoration. David had uh, entered into this moral failure and it caused the death of Uriah who was his lover's husband. And so the prophet shows up and he confronts David about his ways and David realized the error of his ways and he repented. And this tragic mistake that happened, it brought such a disconnection from him and God that he was in a state that he had never been in before. David realized that he had lost the joy of his salvation. Remember, David is a man after God's own heart. He's the psalmist of Israel. And as the psalmist of Israel, he has no song in his heart. He, the musician of all musicians has no melody of his, in his soul. And David cries out to God in Psalms 51 and he requests, God, restore the joy of my salvation. Uh, don't take your spirit from me. And what does God do? God does just that. He restores his joy. He restores his passion. He creates in him a clean heart. And maybe you're in a season where you've lost your joy or lost your passion or lost your compassion passion for the things of God. I got good news for you this morning. Just like David cried out and got it back, you can cry out to God and get it back because God is a God of restoration. And then there's the awesome story of mankind's restoration. And this is really the real story of Christmas uh, that has escaped the view of most. And though we know the scriptures of the prophet Isaiah and others, many never put the pieces together that this was God keeping his promise to Eve after the fall of mankind. Because of their sin and disobedience, God had a restoration plan. Somebody shout out a restoration plan. See, what was lost in the Garden of Eden that day, it would be restored through the virgin birth of Jesus. That was the master plan of God. And this is really our focus for today is that what does this mean for our lives and for you? It means that for whatever has caused you to detour from the plan of God, that God has a proven plan in his word for your recovery and restoration. Adam and Eve detoured, but God already had a restoration plan. If you're in need of a restoration plan this lesson is for you today the next thing that we see is the entitlement through Christ for restoration that when I look in the Bible I can see that through the finished work of Jesus Christ we have an entitlement to all that was lost with Adam and Eve's sin see Adam was a representative of mankind in the earth and so he was our representative and we see that entitlement when you look at that word entitlement it means to have a bona fide right to something it's not an automatic possession but I'm entitled to it and all of the entitled promises of God are received by faith and so I want to first look at so you understand what you have a right to be restored in your life let's first look at what the devil stole from mankind that Jesus came to restore and why the virgin birth is so important because you got to know what Lucifer stole from you what Lucifer stole from us and when I say Lucifer I'm talking about the official name for the Satan that for Satan that was part of the angelic host in, uh, in, in eternity past see what Satan did is he attempted to rebel against God and he tricked about a third of the angels in heaven to follow his wicked plan and so his plan was destroyed by God and he Lucifer deceived uh, angels and those angels were stripped and cast out of heaven and we see him in 
chronological scripture, we see him in the Garden of Eden speaking through a serpent. But see, in order to understand what he stole, I've got to understand the full sovereign plan of God. See, Adam was created in the image of God, and he is the representative of the human race. And from the Old Testament to the New Testament, the scriptures are woven together in this amazing theological tapestry of God's proven plan to bring restoration to man. Remember, in the beginning, God declares that man should have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl over the air, and over every living thing that creepeth upon the earth. And the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, 22, for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. So you really understand what you have a right to. I got to take you back to the beginning and bring you to the end where we have Jesus who restores the power and authority back to man. So first we see God creates a perfect world and he gives it to man, Adam. God gives mankind, Adam, power and authority to run the earth. God observes mankind exercising this power and authority. The Bible says, Adam, whatever you call it, that's what it's going to be. So Adam has the authority and the power to declare what is so in the earth. And so God places Adam in this garden and he gives restrictions on mankind to not eat of a certain tree for man to demonstrate his obedience and allegiance and he levied a death consequence on mankind if they disobeyed he says Adam the whole garden is yours but don't touch that tree don't eat of that tree don't eat of that tree you can eat of anything else but don't eat of that tree and Satan comes along and deceives Eve and eventually Adam into eating the forbidden, the forbidden fruit. And so when Adam obeys Satan, he loses his power and authority to Satan and experiences spiritual death. He experiences this separation from God and it sets in motion physical death. So when Adam sins as a re representative of the human race, the consequences fall on all who would be born after him. And so there are consequences for sin in the earth. And so God sends Jesus in fulfillment of the prophetic word spoken in Genesis chapter 3 about the seed bruising the head of the serpent. And Jesus is born of the seed, which we see over in the New Testament. Jesus is born of, a, of, the, of the seed of a woman with no man involved. Now I need you to pause right here. Because Jesus is born of the seed of a woman but there's no man involved, meaning that Jesus's blood is unique because it's without sin, which means the consequences of sin, which are death, what does not apply to him. And thus the reason for the virgin birth and science says that the blood of the fetus does not normally mix with the mother's blood. How awesome is the plan of God that when Adam messed up, he already had a plan of restoration to bring Jesus to the earth to redeem and restore man back to its rightful place. So for a season, Satan Lucifer had authority in the earth that we dealt that was delegated to mankind from God, but Adam gave it over and until sinless Jesus took our sins upon himself to pay the sin debt of death for Adam's disobedience, Satan is in authority. But thank God, Jesus came to the earth. The Bible says that he died and he rose again and Jesus restores the power and authority back to man which makes all the works of Satan illegal which we have the power to stop. So even though the enemy has stolen from us, we have a right to victory and authority and restoration because of Jesus' shed blood. So I've got to understand that Satan has a tactic. He wants to, he desires to replace and overthrow God himself. He desires to embarrass God by our disobedience. He wants to impose his will in the earth, but can only do so through will and vessels. He wants to eradicate the plan of God, but the lordship factor secures the restoration for us. See, when we make Jesus the Lord of our lives and we become a part of the family of God, those things that were stolen from us at the fall of man are restored 
restored to us in entitlement form. So when you declare Jesus as Lord of your life, according to Romans 10 and 9, you're not just making a confession or any confession. You are securing those promises that are entitled to the covenant believer. And the scripture reveals that, uh, that we are now in the plan of God and God gives back to us what the devil stole from us. He says, when you make me Lord, you are in the family of God. And now the, because of the finished work of Christ Jesus, there are some things that are restored back to man. So everything that the enemy thought he took from us, the Lordship secures it back to us. That everything that the enemy thought he stole from us or tried to steal from us, that our lordship factor secures it for us. What does it secure for us? What does it restore to man? See, the finished work of the Christ child uh, of Jesus restored access to God. And this is where we ought to get excited because we don't have to go through somebody to get to God. The Bible says we can come boldly to the throne of grace. And through the finished work of the Christ child Jesus, we can come directly to God for ourselves. That when Jesus died on the cross and the big thick veil in the temple that separated the people from their direct access to God was rent in two from the top to the bottom. It signified the way God was now being restored and our access to God was restored restored I could come boldly to the throne of grace and obtain mercy and find favor in his eyes and the Bible says let us fearlessly and confidently and boldly draw near to the throne of grace as a believer you ought to get excited that you don't have to go through somebody but you've got direct access to God the finished work of the Christ child Jesus not only restored access to God but it restored authority of God See, that authority that had been given over to Satan and all the demonic powers, we have been given authority now over every serpent, every scorpion, over every satanic attack, and Jesus Christ restored authority authority back to man you have the authority that whatever you say and declare to be lawful in the earth it's lawful whatever you say and declare to be unlawful in the earth it is unlawful in the heavens he restored the authority of God so I can call those things which be not as though they were I can speak to mountains and command them to move death and life are in the power of your tongue the finished work of the Christ child Jesus restored the access to God, the authority of God. Here's the third one. It restored the assets of God. This is the one that you ought to get excited about because we have a right to the blessing and kingdom assets have been restored to us. The Bible says he who did not withhold or spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all. Will he not also with him? So I can have Jesus and great things because the Bible says, will he not also with him freely and graciously give us all other things so I don't have to live a barely making it barely getting along barely surviving life that the Christ child Jesus restored the assets of God to me so the father that owns a cattle on a thousand hills his streets are made with gold the one that declared that he wants me abundantly supplied and to live in the overflow because of the Christ child Jesus I have access I have authority and I have the assets of God here's the fourth when the finished work of the Christ child Jesus restored the ability of God so we are made we are new creatures with the resident power of God on the inside of us we have supernatural ability the creativity of the human race and the sovereign potential of mankind was restored back to man you have strength through Christ Jesus the Bible says I have strength for all things in Christ who empowers me I'm ready for anything and equal to anything through him who infuses inner strength into me I am self sufficient sufficient in Christ's sufficiency you are not you're not some low thing you're not somebody that can't handle situation but you got the power of God working on the inside of you greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world when you're weak that 
that's when he's strong. You got the ability to do all things. You got the ability to overcome statistics, to overcome the odds. You got the ability of God, the assets of God, the authority of God, and the access of God was restored to man because of the Christ child Jesus. What does that mean to us as Christians? That when I look at the Christmas story of Jesus' birth and his death, burial, and resurrection and his whole life, because remember, the baby boy was the beginning of the process to restore man back to the place of fellowship, communion, and authority with God. And so when I look in the Bible, I can see that not only are we recipients of the restoration power, but we ought to be distributors of that same restoration grace. See, this is where the lesson requires some maturity. Because we can shout, we want to shout about the things that God's going to restore to us. But can we talk about you having to be the restorer for somebody else? Because we have to be ready to restore broken relationships because God was willing to restore our broken relationship with him. He expects us to restore others in the same like manner. I knew y'all were going to get quiet on this one, but just stick with me because all the things you want restored in your life, you've got to also be an agent of restoration concerning relationships. And the truth be told, God looks at how we manage our horizontal relationships here on the earth as a barometer of our relationship with him. See, you can't say you love God and then hate your brother. Now, let me take you to the scripture. First John 4 20 says, if anyone says I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar for he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. The Bible says that God is looking at how we walk in love with others and he, how we demonstrate that loving care for others in our love for him so if we will not demonstrate loving care for our brothers and sisters here on the earth and here in the now we cannot say that we really love God if you won't be nice to the people that you deal with on a daily basis it's a shocking revelation that motion motivate us to get things right with our natural spiritual brothers and sisters. You know, when you read uh, the message, the, the ABCs of faith or the God kind of faith in Mark 11, 22, 23, 24, most people want to stop before they get to the scripture where it says, and when you pray, forgive. That you got to walk in forgiveness with others and God won't hear your prayer because God is holding us accountable for how we deal with our spiritual brothers and sisters and our natural brothers and sisters. And what better time of the year to bring restoration to some relationships during this season when we receive the greatest gift of restoration, we ought to be willing to give that gift to others. And this is where you got to examine yourself. Because God exhorts us to restore others. And because God is a restorer and we are created in his image and we have his nature in us, then we have the capability to bring restoration in broken relationships. And I want you to listen to this part because this is not something that I'm making up, dreaming of, or trying to be cute. This is a mandate by God. And when you walk in a place where you're willing to restore others and reconcile relationships, that's where you tap into the manifested blessings that God has for your life. So if I want God to restore some areas in my life, I've got to be willing and actively involved in restoring others who may have offended and hurt me and the new testament believers were admonished to be on alert to move past the offense moments to a place of a strengthened relationship whenever possible see uh, what i'm saying here is that we are instructed to forgive to walk in love and restore relationships we are not instructed to restore toxic relationships we are not instructed to restore toxic relationships that have the potential of threatening our emotional, physical, or spiritual relationships. What I, I am not saying, go and restore a relationship with a criminal or somebody that has uh, violated you in such a way uh, who is unrepentant and unvented. But what 
I am saying to you, it's time to let it go and forgive and let God vindicate you. And here is the deal that most Christians miss is that forgiveness and trust are two different things. See, I can forgive you and let go of the offense, but I still want to make sure that there's a track record for you to prove your trust that you can, I can trust you. So I'm not going to bring somebody into my intimate space that's toxic and not good for my well-being, but I'm not going to hold on to what they did to me 10 years ago. I'm going to let it go. I'm going to walk in love and I'm going to apply the blood of Jesus to my conscience and my mind to cleanse my mind of dead works somebody say you got to choose to not be offended the bible says in galatians 6 1 brethren if a man be overtaken in a fall you which are spiritual restore such a one in the spirit of meekness considering thyself lest thou also be tempted bearing ye one another's burden and so fulfill the law of christ i believe this message is so important because a lot of people can't have a happy holiday because you holding on to offense and this is a season where we ought to be agents of restoration. That, that you, you won't even go around family because you holding on to an offense of something that happened years ago. But the spirit of God instructs us uh, what to do in relationship restoration. Uh, um, let, let's look at this in Romans chapter 12. It says, repay not no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of the Lord, if possible. So far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will, re you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Do you see the exhortation of the scripture to restore others? It says, don't get in a tit for tat doing evil for evil. You got to make a declaration that you're going to live peaceable with all men and you trust God to vindicate you. I know I got to work on this because see, I need you to understand that there's power in restoring others. That that offense that you're holding on to, you're going to miss what God wants to do in your life by being offended. And see, many times we think holding on to the offense will hurt the offender, but you're really hurting yourself more than you're hurting them. And I knew this wasn't the part that we all was going to jump up and shout about. But I don't know about you, but it's refreshing to know that I can let go. I can release that. I can release the offense. Be in a position for God to bless me and know that God is a great vindicator. See, my prayer is God, let them live long enough for them to see you bless me. God, let them live long enough to see me walk in the favor of God. God, let them live long enough. I'm praying for my enemies because what you meant to destroy me God's going to turn it for my good and I want you to live long enough to see me walk in the blessing of God and I don't have to try to set you up or do evil against you I'm going to walk in love I'm going to maintain my peace and I'm going to trust God to do what he does so that means I've got to let go of fence because the blessing of living out restoration and this assignment that we are given by God to restore others and the one that Jesus has modeled for us is that when we are agents of restoration and we are actively reconciling with others and letting go of offense, the blessings of the Lord will flood our lives. And thank God that he gives us the strength and he has enabled us to move past being offended at mankind. And I don't know about you that I'm grateful that he moved past the offense of mankind. He moved past, uh, you know, judging us by our faults. And despite our imperfections, he still loves us. And if he can still love us past our imperfection, that means I've got to move past some things that I may not like in others so that I choose not to be offended. 
See, offense occurs within friendships, de deteriorating covenant relationships. Offense occurs within the family unit, destroying the family circle. Offense occurs in the workplace, derailing careers and relationships. Offense occurs in the church, causing division and resentment in the house of God. And you won't serve and be on your post where God has assigned you because you got offended. God has so much more on the other side. I'm here today to tell you, you got to let it go and trust the power of a restoration. See, there's a powerful, refreshing revelation how we should handle offense because, see, offense is a tormentor. It's a perceived violation or attack of wrongdoing which causes anger, bitterness, hurt, and ultimately resentment. And because of the dis devastating impact of offense, the Bible addresses it clearly and it's worthy of us looking at so that we can indeed have a happy new year and a happy holiday because I let the offense go and now I'm in a place of peace and I'm going to be an agent of God's compassion and love towards others and I'm not going to let the enemy steal my joy because I choose to let it go somebody shout out let it go See, we have to overcome the temptation to be offended and we do it in various ways. See, you got to control your thoughts. You got to control your tongue. You got to control your team and you got to control your temperament. I'm going to come back to that. But see, I need you to remember that you're going to need the weapon of peace so you don't let offense cause you to lose it. See, the enemy will set you up and, and instead of you being an agent of restoration, you start being, you get on the other side and try to take matters in your own hands. And it is very possible that somebody will wrong you or that you have been wronged. But you got to decide, I'm not going to take offense. I'm going to let God vindicate me. And see, when you choose to focus on fulfilling your destiny, you can overcome the pitfalls of offense. See, we have to maintain this openness that we're going to confront God's way and be confronted to avoid default offenses and protect ordained relationships, knowing that the God that you serve, that you can trust, the righteous vindication of God that's promised in his word. So you got to decide to do several things. You got to decide, I will not take offense by controlling my thoughts. I'm not going to make assumptions in situations. See, you got to decide you're not going to assume somebody's intent when you, that's not even what they meant to do. And a lot of times relationships are, fact, uh, are fractured because somebody has made an assumption about another. That means I got to control my thoughts. I'm not going to let a thought fester in my mind. You don't take offense by controlling your tongue. The Bible says a kind word turns away wrath. You got to confess the power of the blood of Jesus to purify your heart and your mind. You got to decide I'm not going to take offense by controlling my team. That means I've got to watch the company that I keep. Because there are some people that like to stir up confusion and this discord and if they're coming to you telling you what he said about you and then going back and telling them what they said what you said about them then you got some messy people in the mix and they are drawing you away from what God has for you I want somebody in my life that will tell me hey you're not walking in love in this situation you got to get it right don't take offense by controlling your temperament now here is where maturity takes place because if you're going to walk in love and be an agent of restoration, that means you've got to maintain a, a disposition of love and the compassion of Jesus Christ. And see, some of us, have, I'm not going to put myself in that category because I want victory in this. But some of you back in the day, before Christ, you mastered nice nasty. Y'all know what nice nasty is. In this day and age, they call it shade. You know how to cut without people knowing they've been cut. You know how to throw shade and they don't even know that you just threw shade. You know how to smile, but really your disposition is, I don't fool with you, I don't like you, and get away from me. It's that nice nasty. And I was a professional nice nasty. I'm going to smile, but I want you to know by the words of my mouth, how I put them together, I really don't like you. And that's not walking in the love of Christ. And if I'm going to be in a position where I need the restoration of Christ, and I don't want to mess up my 
our prayer life and I don't want to mess up the blessings of the Lord I cannot stay in this position of nice nasty where it makes my flesh good but I'm out of faith I want to be in a position of faith where everything I ask God for comes to pass so I'm going to walk in love I'm going to maintain my peace and I'm going to let the compassion of Jesus flow out of my heart because it's bigger than the person I got too much I'm believing God for so I'm going to be the one that goes after restoring relationships. I'm going to be the one that's an agent of reconciliation. I understand that he'll cleanse my thought life by applying the blood. And I've got to apply the blood. I've got to apply God's love to that situation. So he gives me the fortitude to have the right temperament when I interact with others who have offended me. Pastor, okay, all oh, that's good. What's my regimen? Because... Truth be told, there are some relationships that need to be restored. You're going to see them on Sunday. You may see them this week. And uh, your whole holidays and enjoying the joy of the season is on hold based on that relationship. And again, I'm not talking about toxic relationships. I'm talking about those relationships that have been strained. That God is holding us accountable in this season to really reflect on the whole restoration plan that he gave to us and be a distributor of that. Here's what you got to do. The Bible really makes it clear. Matthew 18 verse 15 says, if another believer sins against you, go privately and point out the offense. If the other person listens and confesses, you have won that person back. But if you are unsuccessful, take one or two others with you and go back again. So that everything you say may be confirmed by two or three witnesses. If the person still refuses to listen, take your case to the church. Then if he or she won't accept the church's decision, treat the person as a pagan or a corrupt tax collector. The Bible says before you blast them on the internet... And before you get on Facebook talking about how you don't like them and people ain't right when they treat you and my hate is this and you telling everybody on Facebook about your issue with somebody in your family. The Bible says before you get on Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, and TikTok talking about how you don't like somebody, you go to your brother first. So I got number one, get beyond the fatal offense. I got to choose that I'm going to live my life without being offended, believing that God will perfect all that concerns me. I got to decide I'm not going to be a person that's easily offended. So if somebody don't speak to me, I start letting the enemy play with my mind, telling me they don't like me. I've got to choose that I cannot allow offense to come in. I'm believing God for too much. Then number two, you must boldly forgive the offender. It is the will of God that though there may be resistance and pushback of the flesh, I'm going to obey God and forgive. So God, I I forgive so-and-so and I forgive so-and-so and I forgive so-and-so. God, I thank you that you have forgiven me of my faults and my sins and my transgressions and when I didn't do things right. And so that same forgiveness that I, I need so desperately, I choose to forgive X, Y, Z, A, B, and C. And then you must be forward but open. See, you have to decide. You're going to take the initiative. And this is where the strength of the Holy Spirit comes in. Because you got to step into this moment of restoration with an open mind because you may clearly see your part. You got to, then what this, what, it, what this step does is it shows you your part in the offense moment. And you got to be open for restoration. See, sometimes we say we forgive, but we're not open for restoration. You have to be open and choose, I want to move forward. Here's the next one. You must believe for a favorable outcome. You got to seek to restore with believing faith and not with a pessimistic attitude. You got to decide, I want God to be glorified in this relationship. Here's the final one. You must be in faith for the overflow. See, you got to start expecting to experience the overflow blessing from the Lord and watch God amaze you. A story is told of a couple friends who went hiking in the mountains and they became lost. And so as night began to fall and the winter cold set in, those friends thought they were doomed for death. And they knew that the town would send out a search party for them, uh, but would the rescuers make it in time? And so the winter cold and the snow could surely be their demise if they didn't get help 
fast. And so they aimlessly stumbled upon an old abandoned cabin that had been occupied by hunters for several years, uh, many years prior. And so when they got to the old cabin, they start searching the cabin for anything that would help them in their situation. There were no provisions to sustain them, but all they found in their search was an old backpack. The cabin didn't provide much shelter to them and so they could still feel the chill of the wind and the snow and the cold because the window had no panes and there was no door. And so as the temperature is dropping, all they have is this old backpack. And so they began to look in the old tattered backpack and much to their surprise, they found a box of matches. It was just what they needed. And so they quickly built a fire in the corner to keep them warm. And then they went outside and built a fire so that it could signal to the rescue party exactly where they were. So when the rescue party arrived to take them to safety, one of the men went back and picked up the backpack to carry it home with them. And so they were now home and they were safe at home. They had been saved from this winter storm. And as they reflected on their ordeal, one man said, isn't that amazing that that old backpack that was left behind years ago would be the very thing that would save our lives? Who would have ever thought that something that happened years ago would be the key to our rescue and our salvation? As they began to talk about the whole situation, the man that went back for the backpack, he said, yep, I kept the backpack because I was trying to find a name or somebody that left the backpack so that I could thank them, but I couldn't find anybody. He says, I'm so thankful for that unknown traveler who left his backpack behind because it could have went another way. And as I thought about this story, I saw the picture of the scripture. See, the principles that we live by gives us dominion and that dominion was given to us years ago uh, through the work and through the plan of Jesus Christ. Thank God that something happened so many years ago that started in a little town called Bethlehem. It happened in a manger, in a stable. It passed through a hill called Calvary and it ended on resurrection morning. It was that that happened years ago that is the key to our peace key to our freedom, key to our joy. I don't have to worry because of what happened years ago. I don't have to have anxiety because of what happened years ago. What Jesus did years ago, it restored life to us. It restored health to us. It restored strength to us. God intended for us to live the overcoming abundant life. When he sent his son to the earth, it was the gift of the Christ child that was given to mankind. That was a demonstration of of his relentless love for us and unlike the hikers who don't didn't know where their help came from we know exactly who is responsible for our salvation we know exactly who is responsible for our restoration we know exactly who paid the ultimate price for us and can I take you back to the moment where the angel identified who he is they asked us in the Christmas trivia what Jesus name means and so, you know, I, I wasn't thinking sent one because anytime you say the name of Jesus, I start thinking about who he really is. It's that name that's above every name. When I start thinking about the name of Jesus, because I know where my help comes from. I know where my deliverance comes from. I know where my peace comes from. I know where my joy comes from. He is a wonderful counselor. He's a majestic God. He's matchless in all his ways. He He's our great God. There's nobody like him. And if you allow me for a moment, let's just talk about the gift of Jesus that was given to us because there is nobody like our Lord. He is the first and the last. He's the beginning and the end. I'm just looking for somebody who understands it's more than a baby that was born in a manger. He is my help. He's the architect of the universe and the manager of all time. He always was. He always is is and he always will be I'm talking about Jesus the lamb that was slain for the foundation of the world he was bruised and yet he brought healing he was pierced and yet he eased our pain he was persecuted and yet he brought freedom he was dead 
and yet he brought light. I'm talking about Jesus. The world can't understand him. The armies can't defeat him. The schools can't explain him. The leaders can't ignore him. Herod tried, but he couldn't kill him. The Pharisees couldn't confuse him. Nero couldn't crush him. The new age can't replace him. Hitler couldn't silence him. The grave couldn't hold him. He is the light of my salvation. He is the lover of my soul. He is my Lord. He's my King of kings and Lord of lords. And I'm just looking for some believers this morning that understand who he really is. Do you know who he is? Do you know him as wonderful counselor, prince of peace and mighty God? He's Adam's redeemer. He's Abel's vindicator. He's Noah's ark. He's Abraham's sacrifice. He's Moses' burning bush. Do you really know him as a restorer? Do you really know who our God is? He's Joseph's battle axe. He's Samson's strength. He's Gideon's fleece. He's Daniel's lion tamer. He's the three Hebrew boys, man in the fire. He's David's music and restorer of the joy. He's Solomon's wisdom. Do you know him? just looking for somebody who understands this is more than just a cute story. He is God and there's nobody like him. He's Ezekiel's wheel in the middle of the wheel. He's Jeremiah's bomb in Gilead. He's Matthew's king. He's Mark's suffering servant. He's Luke's great physician. He's John word made flesh. He's Acts coming of the Holy Ghost. He is my savior. He is my Lord. He is my restorer. He's my reconciliator. He's my deliverer. He's my way maker. I start talking about him and I get excited because I understand it's more than a baby. I understand it's not more than just a man. He's the one that took my place. He's the one that took up on sin who knew no sin. His name is Jesus. He's the Christ. He's the true and living God. He is the anointed one. I'm not going to take him out of the Christmas season. He's all the way in it. And because of him, we live, have our being. He is love. And when I think about it, there's no mountain he won't climb up. There's no shadow he won't light up coming after me and if I will say yes to him and because I said yes to him I've experienced his relentless love that will not fail will not give up there's no wall he won't kick down there's no lie he won't tear down coming after me so when haters rise or situations show up I can forgive why because he's got my back there's a relentless love that fights for me that goes after me that chases me that covers me that keeps me I'm talking about the one named Jesus he's our Lord and Savior and if I have anybody in this building who's experienced the love of God I need you to lift up your voice and let out a shout and thank God for Jesus our restorer our reconciliator our God our strength and our peace